may be seated and good to see you this morning. Good morning to you. And uh, looking forward to uh, our worship together today. And I want to just remind you about Operation Christmas Child and those uh, boxes for that are in the back back there. You can pick those up. Uh, The uh, National Collection Week is November 14 through 22. And uh, so just especially uh, uh, remember uh, that. And then also uh, just our prayer needs today. Uh, I want to especially uh, remember uh, uh, Dwight's with us this morning, but Mary Ann, his wife, has been sick, still uh, battling with that. And so just especially remember uh, Mary Ann Taylor uh, in your prayers. Uh, T's cousin, uh, Cecilia McCullough, has uh, been on home dialysis for several years, but running into some issues. And, and uh, just especially remember uh, that request. Uh, Gaynell Lynch, uh, been on our prayer list, uh, Jerry and, and Joey Rogers, we continue to remember in prayer, uh, Amy Booker. Uh, also, and Mr. Conrad and Miss Betty uh, this week, and uh, he had uh, surgery, and, and that went well. And uh, so, just especially remember them. John Stubbs has some surgery upcoming, and uh, remember him. Uh, Brenda Wilson, Christie's mother, she said uh, got surgery went well, some rehab and things like that going on now. So, just especially uh, thankful for that surgery uh, going well, and praying for uh, her uh, continued recovery. Uh, Miss Doris Knight's doing good at home. Thankful for that. I want to ask you to continue to remember her in prayer. Uh, Griffin Blanco, uh, Buster Wilson, uh, continue to remember him and, and the needs that he has. Uh, Bethany Cooper, uh, uh, Kathy and, and Dalton Campbell, continue to pray for them and Kathy's recovery and strength. Uh, Danny Coven, uh, Jerry Warren, and, and uh, Step Lena, and then uh, Tom. His bed is here today, but Tom still having some some struggles and issues. They've got some doctor's appointments this week, so just especially remember Tom uh, in your prayers. Uh, Collins Walters would be continuing to remember her and good things that are happening with her. Uh, Billy Pate, uh, Joan Kitchum, uh, Dwight Bennett, Carlton Ward, Elaine Gray, uh, Mr. Hireman, Miss Jimmy, uh, Miss Jackie Skipper, uh, Randy Higdon, and his father Clifford Higdon are all the ones that are on our our prayer list that we're lifting up in prayer. If you would open your Bibles this morning to the book of Zechariah. The book of Zechariah. And uh, it's easy to find. You just go to Matthew and, and back up about two books. And there it is. The book of Zechariah. And I want to turn to the ninth chapter. I want to just read one verse. And that's verse 9. This is probably one of the key, key verses in all of the book of Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9. And it's a prophecy. Uh, a verse of scripture that happened long before it was fulfilled. And if you just listen to the verse, you'll know the fulfillment of it. It occurred uh, in, the, in the New Testament when Jesus uh, came riding into Jerusalem. Listen to what Zechariah said. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a coat, the foal of a donkey. Would you bow together with me as we go to the Lord in prayer? Heavenly Father, we do come to you today and we thank you so much for the beautiful day that you've given to us. Realizing, Lord, that every day is a day that you've put together and crafted for a specific purpose. And Lord, this is your day, the Lord's day, we call it. Father, a day when we can come into your house, when we can come together in corporate worship and focus on you. Give you praise, give you thanks, and then turn to the Word, the Bible that you left us, and open it up and study it together. And Lord, we have the direction of the Holy Spirit to help us and aid us as we study together your Word. Father, we pray that we will experience your Holy Spirit speaking to us through the written Word of God, that you will make it alive in our hearts, and that, Father, it will be used in the day days to come as we live our lives beyond this building in the world in which we live. Father, we do come today to give you thanks for answered prayer. And again this week, 
you have answered our prayers. And we have specific references to it. And we thank you for it. And Lord, we come today to lift these that are on our prayer list up to you. Lord, those that are still struggling with various health issues, we pray for them. And we ask for your comfort and for your strength in their lives. We pray, Father, for uh, those who are just dealing with heart issues and, and, and the struggles of just life. And we pray for them and we ask for your supplied strength to show up in their lives. We pray, Father, for those that have tests and we ask that you grant good results, that you help doctors to be able to pinpoint areas of problem and, and then to be able to correct that, to bring health back to those that we're praying for. Lord, again, we just thank you for the privilege of being together today, the opportunity to sing and to study your word. Pray for our Sunday school that will come in, in a little while and for our teachers and we pray for them and, and, and lift them up to you as they prepared and, and as they are ready to share in the classes. And Lord, we thank you again for just the Lord Jesus, our Savior, the one who loved us and who died for us. And we can't thank you enough for that gift of eternal salvation through Jesus. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for giving us the privilege of gathering together to worship. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, if you would open your Bibles to Zechariah chapter 9. Zechariah, the ninth chapter today, as we uh, continue in our uh, series of messages on the minor prophets. And uh, we are walking our way through uh, a study of uh, these last 12 books in uh, the Old Testament. Uh, they are divided into two sections. I mentioned this last Sunday. I want to just mention it perhaps for the last time this morning. But these 12 books are divided into two sections or groups. The first nine of the prophets, as they are laid out in your Old Testament, are prophets who preached before Israel went into captivity. And so all of those prophets, all the way from uh, Hosea to Zephaniah, are are all preaching to Israel and they're saying to them, repent, because uh, uh, God's going to come with his judgment. It's kind of what preachers today do and what preachers have been doing for a long time now. And that's saying, hey, one of these days Jesus is going to come. And you need to make preparation for the return of the Lord. That's kind of what those first nine prophets were all about. And then, of course, the nation didn't repent. And they went into 70 years of captivity. And as they came out of that captivity, God raised up three men, uh, Haggai, Zechariah, that we're going to study today, and Malachi. And all three of these men, these prophets of God, they preached after that captivity. As the people were coming out, there were responsibilities, things God wanted them to do. And he sent men to challenge them and to encourage them them about the work of God and about doing it. Now, Zechariah and Haggai are different, but God used them. Uh, all of us are different, and God uses us. We have unique skills and abilities and, and, and different ways in which we approach things, and God uses all of that to accomplish his work. Haggai was more of a, of a practical kind of a, of a prophet or a preacher. He was uh, interested in, in trying to help the people understand how what God had to say to them should encourage them and move them forward. Zechariah was more of a vision kind of oriented preacher. He understood the vision of God. He understood what God wanted the people to do. And always throughout his book, he is trying to keep that vision uh, in front of the people. Now, I've got to be honest with you. This is the longest of the minor prophet books. There are 14 chapters in this book of Zechariah. 
So you can already understand I've struggled a little bit today with how to deal with the content of 14 chapters. It has not been my intention to preach verse by verse or chapter by chapter through these prophets' books, but to just bring one message and give you an overall feel for what the book is about. So uh, the, the, this book is divided into three different sections. And, and I first looked at it and said, well, that's three points right there. But then how in the world do you cover six chapters and then two more and then six more? And so I, I prayed a lot about it and I think God's given me the direction for this morning. But in order to help you understand the book of Zechariah, I've put a little outline of the book in your notes there. That's the first thing right under introduction that you'll see is the outline. And that's just a, a general outline that'll give you a feel for what the book of Zechariah is all about. The first six chapters compose the first part of the outline. And that has to do with the future that is revealed. And what God does through Zechariah in chapters 1 through 6 is he reveals to him and Zechariah reveals to the people of God the future. Uh, what, what was going to happen, what he wanted them to do and accomplish. And he does it through a series of visions. If you read those chapters 1 through 6, they are visions. In fact, uh, God gave Zechariah eight visions in the night and he used those visions to help the people understand what God wanted them to do. So the first six chapters deal with that with the future that is revealed. And then when you come to chapter 7 and 8, that has to do with the fast review. The people started asking questions about the fast and about fasting. And, and uh, Zechariah helped them out in those two chapters because they had gotten a little hung up on uh, the fast itself. And he helped them to understand that really the fast is about the heart. And it's about helping you with your heart. The only reason you want to fast is because you become so serious about something in your life that you want to devote full attention to it. And he helped them understand that just fasting alone won't change what's going on in the heart. And then we come to these chapters 9 through 14. And these chapters deal with the, with the forsaking that is reported. And what he does in these chapters is he reveals that the Lord Jesus is going to come and we're going to talk about that and that when he does come, the people are not going to respond to him favorably. They are going to reject him. And that's what you find in the last part of the book. Now that's the part I want to focus on today. I want to focus on the last section of the book of Zechariah, chapters 9 through 14. We won't look at it verse by verse, chapter by chapter, just hit the high spots and help you see the theme that runs through these chapters. And the theme is about Jesus. Now, Zechariah doesn't call him Jesus. He didn't know that his name was Jesus. He wasn't given that information from God. But you can't read these verses without understanding that that is exactly who Zechariah is talking about. Now this book is really remarkable and fascinating to me. It's remarkable and fascinating because many of the things that Zechariah spoke about in his book happened hundreds and hundreds of years later. So what he says hadn't even come to pass yet. It was yet to come to pass. Now when you walk through the pages of the book of Zechariah, you are going to discover that he goes back and forth with two different themes. He is talking about in some places in his book, and I'll point it out, the first coming of Jesus. In other words, the birth of Jesus Christ and the life that he would live, the purpose for why Jesus came. So all throughout these chapters, he'll, he'll be talking about the first coming of Jesus. And then he'll talk about the second coming of Jesus, the fact that uh, there's going to be a return and Jesus one of these days is going to come. So I just entitled the message, King Jesus. You know, I don't think there's any theme in all the Bible I'd rather talk about than Jesus. I don't think there's any name in all the Bible that I'd rather focus on than the name of Jesus. 
And I'll tell you, I don't think that uh, there, there's any greater theme to, to hold before the people of God other than the theme of salvation than the second coming or the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, I'll tell you, Zechariah, I believe, liked uh, talking about the Lord, and I believe he liked talking about the return of Jesus because it's mentioned so many times in his book. I don't know about you, but I'm looking for Jesus to come. And I don't know about you, but I'm longing for it. And the older I get, the more I long for it. And it hadn't got anything to do with age, but it does have a lot to do with what I see when I look around in the world in which I live. And boy, I'll tell you what, we, we need people to turn to Jesus because what I know is, is that one of these days, Jesus is going to come. And so the question in the key thought of the book of these chapters is this. King Jesus is coming. Are you ready? And so that really is the, 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 the key thought, the phrase, the, the thing that I want you to focus on today. King Jesus is coming. Are you ready? You see, when Zechariah uh, was given these words to speak to the people, uh, the Lord hadn't even showed up. It was hundreds of years before that, but, the, but God wanted the people to know that he was sending the Lord. And, and then once that he did get here, that he would return again. So let's dig into these verses, and I want you to notice four things about King Jesus this morning. In chapter 9, I want you to notice... The coming of King Jesus. The coming of King Jesus. And what uh, Zechariah does is he, he lets us know that the Lord is coming. He's referring to the first coming, that is to the birth of Jesus. And these are remarkable scriptures that lay out for us the first coming of Jesus. You know, the Bible says Jesus, uh, from the very beginning, that God had uh, predetermined that he would send his son. Uh, Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8 says this. It says that he was the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. And listen to what it says in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 20. It says about Jesus, talking about in that passage how we're not redeemed with corruptible things but by the blood of Jesus Christ. And then it says in verse 20 that he was foreordained before the foundation of the world. In other words, when God looked down through the telescope of time, God understood that man was going to be a sinner. God understood that man would be disobedient. And God understood that man was going to need a helper. And God uh, devised a helper for a man. And that helper was his son. And he sent him into the world so that people could be forgiven of their sins. Well, Zechariah talks about all that in chapter 9 hundreds of years before it ever happened. Now I want to tell you, I believe Jesus is coming the second time. You know why I believe that? Because every prophecy the prophets ever made about the first coming of Jesus, 100% of them came true in the New Testament. And that just gives me confidence to know that Jesus Christ is going to come one of these days because his word is true beyond question. Now, I want you to notice several things about the coming of the king. Now, keep in mind, he, he goes back and forth from time to time between the first coming and the second coming, and I'll show it to you. First thing I want you to notice in chapter 9 and verses 1 and following, down through verse 8, is the preparation for King Jesus. The preparation for King Jesus. Now, these are interesting verses, and I, I, I resist the temptation to really dig into the verses. I, I really do. They're fascinating, especially when you take these verses of Scripture and a history person, as I am, a, a minor in history, and you lay them beside one another, they will absolutely amaze you. There are nations that are mentioned in verses 1 through 8. You'll notice different nations that are mentioned in verse 1. Damascus is mentioned. In verse 3, the nation of Tyre is mentioned. Ashkelon in verse 5. And it keeps on going. And it comes to verse 8 and it says, I will encamp around my house. God says, I'm gonna, I'm gonna camp, I'm gonna put an encampment around my house. That would have been Jerusalem. And, and notice why he's gonna do it. He says, because of the army. So an army is coming. And then notice he says, because of him who passes by, somebody's coming by. 
and him who returns. No more shall an oppressor pass through them, for now I have seen with my eyes. Well, who's the army that's coming? And that's what's so amazing. When you lay these scriptures alongside history, what you will discover is that the reference is to Alexander the Great. And when you study the march of Alexander the Great, he came in through Syria, he went down through Phoenicia, and he made his way up to Judah and Jerusalem. In fact, verse 3 talks about Tyre, the, the great city of Tyre, and how it built for itself a tower. It heaped up silver like the dust and the gold like the mire of the streets. But behold, it says, verse 4, the Lord will cast her out. He will destroy her power in the sea, and she will be devoured by fire. And you wonder, well, what in the world is all that talking about? Well, when you study history, Josephus tells us that one of the things that Tyra did is that it built it an island city. It went out into the Mediterranean Sea, and it built a, it built a city out there, in, uh, an island city. It had walls 100 feet high and, and thick, and, and it, it felt like it was its safe place, that nobody could attack it without them seeing them coming, and they would be prepared. But you know what history tells us Alexander the Great did? He took the remains from the old city, tore them down, used the wood and, and, and the poles along with stones, and he just built him a causeway all the way out there across the Mediterranean Sea to the city of Tyre, and he tore it down, and he burned it up by fire in the midst of the sea. I'm just telling you, God's word's true, ladies and gentlemen. You can put it alongside history. You can put it alongside science. It's still going to be the true word of God. You say, well, what's the purpose of all that, preacher? Why would you even say that? Well, do you know what God did? God used Alexander the Great to prepare that part of the world for the coming of his son. You say, well, how in the world? Well, do you know what Alexander the Great did when he took over that part of the world? He introduced a language, the Greek language, and it became the common language of the people of the day. And so rather than, even though there were different languages, the predominant language, like we'd say there are different languages today in the United States, but I hope it's still the predominant one, is English. Well, that's the way it was when Alexander came because he was the king. But what it did was, is when Jesus was born and they began to write the scriptures, reckon what language they wrote them in. They wrote them in Greek, the language of the common people of the day. Hundreds of years before it ever happened, God was preparing for his son to come. Just reminded me of Galatians 4.4 4, when the Bible says, In the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. The preparation for the king. And then in verse 9 of chapter 9, you see the presentation of the king. That's the verse I read a moment ago. I will encamp around my house because of the army, because of him who passes by and him who returns. No more shall an oppressor pass through them. For now I have seen with my eyes, verse 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He's just having salvation, lowly, riding on a donkey, a coat, the foal of a donkey. Well, we know that verse has been fulfilled, don't we? We, we know when it was fulfilled, do we not? It happened uh, in the New Testament. It happened, uh, Mark talks about it in Mark chapter 11. Matthew also talks about it in chapter 21. Every one of the gospel writers talk about it. You know what we call it? The triumphal entry of Jesus. And boy, I want to tell you, the scriptures are fulfilled right down to the minutest detail. In fact, uh, this verse says that he'd come riding on a donkey. Now that would have been correct, just that. But it goes deeper than that, the colt. You notice that? The foal of a donkey. And when you go over to Mark chapter 11, verse 2, Mark tells you that Jesus said to him, you'll go to a certain place and you'll, you'll find, and it was the colt of a donkey. It never had been ridden. Well, that's a miracle within itself. You ever tried to ride a donkey or a horse hadn't been ridden? That's a miracle. The king 
sits upon a coat of a donkey that's never been ridden, and he begins his entry into the city of Jerusalem. My, what a, what a, what a presentation of the king. And I've been studying my Bible for all my life, and I've never seen this. Never, never seen this until I was studying this week. Absolutely just fascinated me, the presentation of the king. You notice it says that he would come riding on a donkey. Now, that may not be significant to you, but it was significant to the people of that day. Until I began to do a little bit of digging, and, and, and I, I think a, a whole lot of digging is just God lets you, lets you stumble on nuggets. You know what I'm talking about? I ain't got sense enough to find it. He just lets me find it. I, I'm, I'm honest. I, I'm honest. I, and and I, I, I was studying this week about that. And you know, sometimes when you read the Bible, there'll be just a little something that just kind of just kind of stirs your soul a little bit about a phrase or about a word, and, and you go back and look at it again. And sometimes you may even you know may even get down and give a little prayer to God, and say, "Lord, I don't know why you got me held up right here, but I, I, I need some light. I, I, I need some direction." And that's kind of the way it was about this donkey this week. And then lo and behold, I ran into a little verse of Scripture and it led me to another verse of Scripture and then that led me to another verse that led me to 1 Kings chapter 1. Chapter uh, 1 and verse 5. And, and what I discovered was is when David was dying and he had selected his son Solomon to be the next king. There in 1 Kings chapter 1 is the story of a usurper to the throne. Uh, one saw an opportunity in the family to, uh, uh, you know, and he, he, started, he started making sacrifices. He, in other words, he made his move. And he's going to usurp David, and he's going to be the king instead of Solomon. Well, the, Nathan found out about it, the preacher, and he went to Bathsheba and, she, and, and told her, and she went to David and told David, and this is what fascinated me, when, when David heard about it, you know what David said? David said, go get my mule. So you see, in those days, the king would have his official mule or donkey, like uh, the presidential limousine. And so what David said was, go, go get my donkey and put Solomon on it and ride him through the streets. And when they did that, everybody who saw it knew that is the next king of Israel. Man, do you, see the, do you see how God put it all together? When Jesus Christ went going down through the streets of Jerusalem on that donkey, the coat of a donkey never been ridden, a miracle out of heaven, and, and, he, and that old donkey just did what God wanted it to do. The people saw it and they said, this is the Messiah. He's the king. And they laid those palm branches down in front of him and said, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of of the Lord. And I want you to just notice as it goes on in these verses uh, down in verse number 11 and I'm going to come back to verse 10 but in verse number 11 it talks about as for you also because of the blood of your covenant. He's talking about a blood covenant. And there was a blood covenant. There was that blood covenant instituted in the Old Testament when the high priest would bring the sacrifices in there and the sins of the people would be rolled back for another year. Oh, bless your heart. That, that's just a picture, ladies and gentlemen, of an ultimate sacrifice that would come in the form of Jesus, the one who would ride on a donkey and ride through the streets of Jerusalem, but who would die for the sins of the world and he would offer the perfect sacrifice for you and me. Oh, no need for another Calvary, ladies and gentlemen. One Calvary is good enough. And Jesus Christ died in order that our sins might be forgiven. Man, what a, what, a, what a Savior. You notice he says, I'll set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. You know, that's a pretty good picture of where people are without Jesus. They're just in a pit. You know, they're just in a pit of sin. They're, they're in a pit uh, of, of, of condemnation. That, that's where they are. Oh, but when the Savior comes, he's able to help us out of the pit. I read a parable years ago. It's always been a sort of amusement to me. It's called the parable of the pit. I guess maybe they got it from this story. I don't know. By the way, I'm not going to finish. Don't worry. <laughs> 
uh, three more points? No way. I did my best to try to get it done one sermon. I just, oh, whew, aren't you glad I didn't try all 14? <laughs> but it was called the parable of the pit. And it's the story of a, of a guy who fell in a, a deep pit and, and, and he couldn't get out. And, and, and several people came by. Uh, there, there, there was a, a, a self-righteous person came by and looked down in there and saw him in the pit. And he said, well, well, my goodness, you must really be a bad person to be down there in such a fix like that. Only bad people get in fixes like that. And he just walked on and left him in the pit. And then a little bit of politician came by. You would know one of them going to come by. A politician came by and he looked down in there and saw the man in the pit. He said, well, my goodness alive. We, you know what? It's just amazing for your sake that we just introduced a bill in Congress just the other day to do away with pits like this so folks don't get in the pits like this. And he walked on and left him in the pit. <laughs> and then a little bit of pessimist came by <laughs> and he said man you're in a real fix said not only are you in a real fix but I do believe I see a cloud and I think you'll be drowned before nightfall and he walked on and left him alone and then here came an optimist oh man you know it's really not as bad as you think it is you can make it if you just try just don't give up though keep on trying you keep on trying after a while you get out of there but he didn't do anything he walked off and left him and then a preacher came by and he said to him, well, I really want to tell you, I, 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 there are three things you need to learn about that pitch in. It's deep, it's dark, and it's dirty. But he didn't tell him how to get out. He left him and he went on his way. But you see, ladies and gentlemen, when Jesus came by and found us in the pit of sin, he didn't condemn us. He didn't tell us we shouldn't have gotten that mess. What he did was he sent us away to get out. And that's what salvation is all about. And that's why Jesus came. And that's why Zechariah got so excited in his prophecies about the first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So you see, you see the preparation for King Jesus to come. You, you, you see the presentation. And then finally, the proclamation of King Jesus. Verse 10 says, I'll, I'll cut off the chariot from Ephraim, the horse from Jerusalem, by the way, this has reference to the second coming of Jesus, not his first coming as the Savior born as a baby in, in Bethlehem, but his second coming when he would cut the chariot from coming into Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem. The battle bow would be cut off. In other words, the battle bow was the, was the defensive weapon. And he shall speak peace to the nations. His domination shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, that hadn't happened yet. God's domination isn't from sea to sea, but one of these days it is going to be. And one of these days he will control it all. And one of these days there will be peace among the nations. They're in peace now. The only time there's ever going to be perfect peace is when the Prince of Peace himself comes back one of these days. But I'll tell you what, there can be peace in your heart and peace in mine today. You see, God wants us to understand what he's about so that we can live our lives in recognition and honor of him. Now, I've been trying to find a place to light this plane, and I've about found it. Little did I know when I read this story two or three weeks ago, God used it today. But I believe that God wants us to understand what he's about and what's going on in the scriptures and in the world in which we live so that we can prepare to be the people he wants us to be today and to live with him forever one of these days. Antonio Stradivaria was a tremendous violin maker. Perhaps they say the greatest violin maker in all the world. When he began making violins, the Amitai family was the best violin maker making family at that time. The concerts for violins in those days were done in very small rooms and courts. But the musical venue was changing when Antonio Stradivari came on the scene. They were beginning to have concert in larger rooms and in bigger venues and, and larger facilities. And there was no microphone amplification. And so he recognized the need for a violin that would be sturdier, stronger, and project its sound further and louder. 
so that people in the furthest reaches of a large room could hear precisely the tone of the violin. And so he chose different wood. He chose different varnishes and stains. He picked out the best of strings. And his Stradivarius violins became known worldwide for their tone and their excellence as a violin. When Antonio Stradivaria died, they discovered a violin in his home. As they examined it, it became known as the perfect violin. In every sense, as they turned it about, looked at the wood, how it had been shaped and formed, uh, the varnish that he had placed upon it, and he had given that violin the title, the Messiah. It had stayed in his home. Nobody had ever seen it. Nobody had ever played it. It resides today in Oxford, England, in a museum, in a case. The only violin in that museum that's in a case. A perfect violin. And no one knows if it's ever been played. And ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you today that God out of heaven sent His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to save and redeem us to be His people. He doesn't want us sitting on the shelf. He doesn't want us not being used for His honor and His glory. Uh, we, 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 we don't need to be sitting in some sort of trophy case somewhere. Man, we need to be allowing the Spirit of God to permeate our very lives and to use us so that our lives bring honor and glory to the Master who saved and redeemed us for His purpose. Boy, He's given us a powerful, powerful purpose. It's to honor Him, to glorify Him, in all that we do. Would you bow together with me as we pray? Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your word today. I thank you, Father, for the power of your word. And Lord, it just excites me as I've looked at this one chapter this week and all these other prophecies that are yet to uncover at how mightily you laid and prepared the scene for your son to come to provide salvation for people in this room today. Father, I thank you that whether we see it or not, whether we feel it or not, whether we can understand it or not, you are at work in our lives long ahead of us if we'll just follow you and trust you and rely upon you. You'll use us like you want to so that we can be examples of your grace, your mercy, and your favor. God, help us today to honor you with our decisions, whether they're public or private. Because, Lord, I believe people can make decisions when they're standing at invitation time just like those who come forward publicly. And sometimes, Lord, it's the private decisions that we need to make just between us and you. And Father, I pray today, if that's the case in the lives of people, that Lord, you'll grant us as we stand in a moment to sing this hymn, the opportunity to respond to you. Lord, I don't want to ever be on the shelf. Let me be usable. Let me be willing to be today. Be willing for the same. You saved us for a purpose. A part of that purpose is to honor you with our life in all we do. Whether we eat, whether we drink, whatever it is, we do it for your glory. Grant that be true. In Jesus' name, amen. Our hymn of invitation this morning is 182. Hymn 182, The Savior is Waiting. Would you turn to that and then as you find it, would you just stand with me as we share together in our invitation time and we'll stand and sing this hymn. If there's a decision that you need to make publicly, I'm here to help you with that. Privately, you can do that right there. While you sing, you can use that as a time of dedication and commitment to God. As we sing this great song. While they're, while they're finishing that out and finishing the that, why don't you let us see God move today? Amen. 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 
Thank you all for those folks, but I, I'm going to introduce them to you in, in, in just a minute. Uh, of course, uh, Rick and Ann Nobles, and they, they've been coming, and uh, this morning they want to they transfer their membership to, to Ollie Branch, so they feel like this is where God wants them to be. And then Luther uh, up to, is also uh, comes this morning. He, his membership is at Bauer, and he's been coming and wants to be a part of uh, our Ollie Branch team. So we're, we're excited for it. this morning. Would you let me know by saying aye? Aye. And all opposed. Uh, thankful for God and his, his blessings. And I think that's cool. I think that's cool. <laughs> what great. Uh, you know, Luther told me, I really thought if I did, I did Luther. He told me one time, I, I met him, and it's been uh, uh, a good while back. He was going to two different churches and said, you know, you know where I'm going? He said, I, I'm cramming for exams. <laughs> Nobody but Luther come up with that. I'm praying for a day. I had forgot that. I, I tell a lot of people, hey, you know what? One of these days, Jesus is coming in. And he makes sure that, that, that we're ready. Hey, I'm going to let y'all go back to the back. If you would, and let our folks come by and just, just shake your hand, hug your neck. God bless y'all. Appreciate y'all so much. Luther reminded me, I, I, had, I, I had called this week and I've had him on my prayer list and I, I didn't mention it a while ago but I, I do wish to pray for Robert Ward Robert uh, and I graduated from my team together uh, you know they were uh, here back or maybe about Easter it was, uh, and uh, we just we cried and I prayed on the phone on the phone and, uh, but he needs our prayer she did this and it's hurt and, uh, you know when the, when the family's hurt, that, that, that's when we need to lift one another up. So just stay safe place. I'm going to reach out to him some more and just try to uh, be an encouragement to him. Hey, let's stand together. I hope you had a good, good day. Don't forget Sunday school that's, uh, that's coming up on the way. But, uh, hey, God's been, God's been good. Now, the only problem, you know, coming down here is such good results. is boy, by the time I get drained, my fire is so <laughs>